So I'm, I'm going to talk about variants and how they are not unions. Um, and I, I promise I'll describe what that means. This is my info if you want to find me on the internet. Um, so just to get uh, something out of the way, I'm not talking about variants. If you've heard of covariance and contravariance, that's not what this talk is about. Don't worry if you haven't. Um, I'm also not going to talk about polymorphism. I'm not going to bore you with Java subclasses and, uh, and interface methods. Uh, this is, a, this is actually a different pattern that we can, that we can use today. Um, so there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem with variants, uh, with teaching variants, because uh, there's, there's a question of what, what are they and why, why should we even use them? So uh, I ask for a little bit of patience while I, while I sort of get from one to the other. I, I promise you we will get there. Uh, so here's the agenda. We're going to start with a short intro. I'm just going to give you a taste of what they look like. Um, we're going to go into a realistic example and see how you might use them or, and why you might use them. Uh, we're going to talk about types for just a little bit, uh, how, to, how to do this stuff with core typed. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the difference between closed and open variants. And then if we have time, we're going to talk about how to store this stuff in Datomic. Uh, so I'm really excited. Let's go. So first, some confessions about who I am. Um, I'm not actually a Lisp person. Uh, you will. Uh, I, I was introduced to Clojure uh, through work as sort of a viable alternative to Ruby uh, for work. But as, as far as hobbies go, you'll generally find me in the, the Haskell and ML crowd. Um, and variants are actually a pattern that, that come from these languages. Uh, and I, I want to reassure everyone that I'm not going to uh, try and shove types down everyone's throat, even though I think types are really super cool, and you should all uh, look into using them. Uh, so don't worry. Um, uh, so why am I here? I'm, I'm here because Clojure is the first dynamic language that I've encountered that's actually flexible to make this work. Um, most other dynamic languages have uh, some really unfortunate syntax choices. And uh, the, the lack of macros make it really kind of impossible to backport this pattern. Um, and, and, and discovering this technique and, and working with Ambrose and, uh, and some other people uh, to, to sort of find it was the moment that, that uh, I realized that Clojure could actually work for me. Um, I'm a language developer, uh, so I, I design and build languages. And so this is, this is super important for that uh, for that. Uh, genre of programming. Um, so I promise not to go on about types, except for the bit in the middle. Um, instead, we're going to focus on variant values and what they look like, how you use them, how you construct them. Um, and we, we like values in Clojure. Uh, they're, they're pretty nice. No one's going to come around and change them. And the same goes for these. So here, the, the point is that they're really, really super useful with or without types. and um, and they're really, really easy to use in Clojure. Uh, so let's, let's take a look at what these things even, even look like. Uh, so they look like this. So no matter how abstract I get today, just uh, remember that all I'm asking you to do is put some keywords in some vectors. Uh, that's it. Um, so variants are tagged data. They're data with a tag. Um, and in order to have a complete implementation of variants, you also have to have a destructuring mechanism. Uh, which in Clojure we have with uh, core match, which is uh, not actually shipped with Clojure. I believe it's in contrib. Uh, it would be really nice if it was just a built-in and you didn't have to import anything. Uh, but, but this is what we got, and it works really nicely. So the things to notice here, uh, data and more data here are variable binders. So those are variables we're introducing with those names. And, and the expressions afterwards use them. Um, and we'll, we'll see more of this in a minute. Uh, so let's, let's imagine for a second. So this is the example part. Let's imagine for a second that we work for a company called Good Bookstore. And we're, we're kind of a traditional bookstore. We have you know, stores. And uh, we sell books, right? And one day, our boss comes to us and says, hey, we're going online. And uh, you know, this whole web uh, 1.5 thing, we're, we're sort of jumping on this train. And, and we say, cool, so, so how are we going to get books to people? Well, there's three ways that the user can choose. Uh, they can have it shipped to them. Uh, they, we can email it to them as a PDF, because we don't like DRM, so we just 
send it as an unencrypted PDF. Uh, or you can pick it up from your local store, right? Um, and for each of these, you'll need a piece of data, right? You'll need, uh, to get it to someone's house, you need their address. Uh, to email it to them, you need their email address. And uh, to get it from a store, presumably you have some sort of store ID that you can look up in some sort of database and get open hours and address and all sorts of stuff. Cool? So let's think about how we would model this, right? Uh, there's, there's a couple of ways, but uh, the, the one that's sort of the most obvious is Clojure has some really nice maps. Uh, so, so let's use a map. Um, we got an address, we got an email, we got a store ID. Um, but this is a little bit of a lie because really you're only gonna be using one of these at a time, right? You're not gonna have someone who, who wants all three of these things for one book. Uh, well, you might, but those would be separate orders. Um, so really, it's gonna look like this. Um, and, and the keys might be missing, but uh, I, I see that as equivalent to them being there and it being nil. Because um, when, you, when you actually look it up, you're gonna get nil. And then, I guess, you probably want some way to tell these apart, so you should probably put uh, some sort of type thing on them. And, and, and at this point, uh, you should be cringing. Um, I am, certainly. Uh, th this kind of problem is hard and, and makes my code bad, and I don't like it. Um, so, okay, we got these maps, and let's, let's say we store it in our usual like SQL database that our boss has told us we have to use. Um, so I guess it looks like this. Uh, it's got, you know, same, same deal, type, address, email, store ID. Uh, and when I see this, this, this is what I see. Let, let no one say my talk had no fancy animations. <laughs> um, so this is bad. There, there are other ways of doing this in, in a relational database, but they, they come with their own pain points. Um, and, and this is sort of the way that, that most of our tools kind of encourage us to do it. Uh, so th this is bad for a number of reasons that you could probably already know. Um, and, and let's say, let's put ourselves in the, in the position of the front end person at our company who's going to be like, uh, implementing the, the store front, right? Uh, they're gonna say, okay, we got this, this delivery item, I guess, uh, and we're gonna, we have to check its type, right? And then we, we're gonna case off the type, and we're making a little string to, to tell the user, you know, how they're gonna get their book, right? Um, and, you know, if it's a delivery, then we have an address key. If it's digital, then we have an email key. Um, if it's pickup, then, then you know, we look it up from a database or something um, and, and grab its address, right? Uh, so we can tell the user where to go. Um, the things I want you to notice here uh, is that, one, you have, a, you have an explicit type check at the, at the top, right? You have this explicit, like, let's look at the value of this thing. And then, and then in the expressions here, you explicitly look up the keys. Uh, with a keyword, and uh, you sort of trust that they're there because the contract is that if it's a delivery, then it has an address key, right? Um, this makes me sad. Uh, why does this make me sad? This is really easy to screw up. Um, the contract that I just described to you, that you have to check the type key, and depending on the value of the type key, you know based on, I guess, documentation, uh, which other keys are available, uh, and then you have to make sure only to use those keys, right? This is hard to keep track of. Uh, I've messed this up before when I've worked with code like this. Um, and, and I really don't wanna put this in my documentation. <laughs> it, it just would make me really sad to do so. Um, I guarantee if you do this, you'll find this beast in your runtime, uh, which, which is just bad. Um, and, and, and you know, here we forgot to actually include a type tag at all. Um, but really, at some point, we, we run the risk of uh, telling the user that we're going to be delivering their book to nil, um, which just makes us look bad. Uh, someone will probably also do this, um, which is equally bad. Um, and uh, someone is liable to do something like this, where they just forget to check the tag, right? Because uh, it's so inconvenient to have to check the tag, and you know, 
They, they know that they're probably going to get the right thing. Um, and, and even if it's just during development, where they're working with like small data sets, uh, and, and they get a null pointer exception, right? Well, what's the, where, what's the stack trace of that null pointer exception going to look like? Uh, and we're in Clojure, so stack traces, are, we kind of don't rely on them anyway. But it's going to say that it can't look up address on nil, right? Uh, assuming that your find store doesn't raise. Um, or it find store is going to say there is no such store with ID nil. Um, and, and these are really hard to debug. Just they, they, they have taken me hours. You have to suddenly trace in, and you have to like figure out why it's nil, and, and then go like, oh, I forgot to check the tag. When it's not really obvious that you forgot to check the tag here, because there's no, there's, you're looking for the lack of something, right? Um, so the core problem is that this map that we decided to use uh, models and. Um, we, we've got one data structure, and we've got three pieces of data, and we put them all together. Um, that's what maps do. They put data together. Uh, you, you can also use a map for its hashing properties, but maps with fixed keys. You just put data together, and you present it. Um, so this model's and, and we've cheated a little bit because every single one of these can be nil, right? And, and by doing this, we've covered more of the space than we really wanted to. Um, there's a better way to do this, uh, and you may not be surprised that it's variance. Um, so we can model or directly. Uh, here's three data structures, and they're all presumably a delivery or a, a, uh, an order, a pending order, and we see that each one of them has a tag that tells you what it is, and then there's the data, right? Um, so this models, models or directly, uh, which is pretty cool. And then when you go to use it, uh, you use this nice match macro, um, and you just get variables, and you just use them, and you don't have to worry that you've misspelled a key, you don't have to worry that you've uh, use the wrong key depending on the value of the tag. Um, it's, it's all just there for you. It's provided by the destructuring. Um, and what's really cool is that in order to access the data, you are forced to check the tag and handle all of the cases. Right, and you're not forced. You could, you could like, you know, do a, because we're, we're emulating this with vectors, so you could do an nth and, and grab the, the thing in index one and just grab the data, right? But that's inconvenient, and that stands out in, in code review, in when you're debugging, you'll, you'll look at this code and be like, well, that's suspicious. Why am I doing nth there? Um, so this is really cool, and it, it, help, it really helps prevent bugs. So uh, structs, which is what I call maps with fixed keys, um, and, and variants have this, this nice dual property to them. Uh, structs have a single constructor where you just sort of put everything together. They have multiple destructors where you take each thing out. Uh, and they, they're, they're really products. Uh, and the, the way that in which they're products is that, uh, for example, if val1 here had, um, had two possible values and val2 had three possible values, they, uh, then the whole thing would have six possible values, right? Because there's six combinations. Um, on the other hand, variants have multiple constructors where you make one of each thing. And they have one destructor where you just destructure the whole thing. And they model sums, right? Again, if val1 had two possible values, val2 had three, then something with tag1 or tag2 would have five, right? There's two in the first case and three in the second. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, I see a lot of code that, that does this. Uh, that, that when the documentation says, oh, you can pass a string or a number or a vector, and, and each of these things has different meanings, and, and they're implicitly defined in the documentation. Uh, so you, you'll be given the meaning of what it means when you pass it a string, or when it returns a string. Uh, you'll be given a different meaning, et cetera. Um, and, and these are unions, by the way. This is just raw polymorphism. Um, so that, that's what I mean by unions. You just sort of put any value wherever you like. Um, with variants, on the other hand, you have this tag that tells you semantically what it is. So the meaning is right there in the data structure in the code. Um, just, just a keyword. It's, it's not that heavyweight, right? So it means what it says. Um, but what if you run into problems, right? Uh, 
what if somebody gives you something that has an unexpected tag? What if somebody puts nil in one of these things and then you get nil? Um, <clears throat> if you want these kind of guarantees, I'm, I'm sorry to say you need types. Um, if you want static guarantees, you have to do static checks, right? Uh, and so in order to do this, uh, you should use Clo Clojure Core Typed. Uh, it's a fantastic library written by uh, Ambrose. You should go follow him on Twitter and use his library. Uh, this is not a talk about Core Typed. Um, I'm just going to sort of gloss over some of the, the gritty details, but um, I, I suggest you go read his excellent documentation. Um, so th this is how you define a variant, right? Uh, and, and this is a little bit weird, so let, let me just walk through it. So def alias just makes a, a name. You're, you're defining the name of a type. And, and the u means union, so you're just saying it can be any of these things. Um, and each of these vectors says, uh, well, it, it says a couple things. So this is a value type, which is a very powerful feature of core type, and we're using it here in order to say that in this, in this part of the union, the first element has to be the value tag one. Right, it's a type that only accepts one value as valid. Um, and, then, and then you have a string, oops. And then you have a string, uh, and then you, you do the same for the rest of them. And what's really magical is that uh, when you destructure this with match, most of the time, it will infer the type of the binder. Right? So, so if you match this and you, you match tag one and put a variable name there, it will infer that that variable is a string based on the fact that the vector had this type, uh, which is really cool and actually didn't work the first time I tried this. And uh, I complained about it on Twitter, and Ambrose fixed it within like a month, which was, I was floored. Uh, so this works most of the time. Uh, and if you're using core typed, you should use it. Um, I actually really don't like this syntax. It, it exposes a lot of weird details, and is just kind of uh, a little cumbersome. Uh, I would propose the following macro, um, which would be so much nicer. Uh, it, and you can see it's just a very, very simple syntax transformation, uh, just to say that this is a variant. Um, I added this slide yesterday after the wonderful talk about Herbert. Um, so you can, you can use variants with Herbert as well. Uh, this, this is a Herbert um, schema that you can use to validate Eden that comes in and you expect to be uh, variants. And you can also use it to generate generators for your tests if you're using variants, which is pretty fantastic. Um, uh, and generators for test check to do uh, property-based testing, which is uh, really super awesome. Um, if you ever want a tree, uh, if you ever want a tree, then you probably want a recursive variant. And this is where my sort of language background shows. Uh, this is the lambda calculus, the untyped lambda calculus, uh, which is, if you're not familiar, is just is a programming language with only three features. It's got lambdas, it's got variables, and it's got application. Um, and nothing else, no literals, no nothing. Uh, and, and you can see here it's represented as a variant where the, the type of the node is, is the tag, and it's got other expressions in its values, right? So this is a, a nice core-typed recursive variant type expression. Uh, you can see that it's an application of two expressions, a lambda from a symbol to an expression, which is a body, uh, or a variable that has a symbol in it, right? Um, and that nice little rec helper allows you to recursively refer to your own type. Um, so that's cool. Here's a nice little evaluator. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to evaluate untyped lambda calculus. This is sort of the most straightforward. Uh, and, and you notice I'm doing a, a destructure on app, and then a, a nice recursion, and then a destructure on the return value. Um, the one feature I haven't talked about of core match here is that underscore at the bottom, uh, which is the default case. So if it doesn't match anything else, we just return it. Right. This implementation doesn't eval under lambda. Some, some implement implementations do. Uh, but if we find a lambda on the outside, we just return it, because we don't know how to evaluate that further. Cool. And, and I've elided the implementation of subst, which is uh, actually kind of non-trivial, because there's some naming stuff to do. Um, 
well, it's just sort of an example of, well, it's an example of the match recur pattern. So you see there's a match and there's a recur. Um, and what that is, is that's a, that's a tree traversal. Anytime you see match and recur, you're probably traversing over a tree. Um, and if you want to traverse over a tree, this is probably the pattern that you want to use. Um, if this looks incredibly familiar to you, you might be a user of Hiccup or one of the number of libraries that have adopted its, uh, its convention. Hiccup uses recursive variants to model HTML, which is a tree, right? Uh, and each node has a type or a tag, uh, and they have values in them, which can be, depending on the thing, it can be another expression or it can be a, um, a string, a text node. Um, and the, the, one of my favorite libraries that has started to use this is Instaparse. Instaparse, if you just sort of create your parser and run it, it will just give you one of these things, uh, just out of the box. And you can destructure it with match, you can do whatever. So this, this isn't a new, a new technique. This has been around for a while. It just hasn't really necessarily been named or um, sort of accepted as a pattern. Um, okay, so there's, there's one other language that, that does this, uh, and it does it pretty well, and, and this is sort of what inspired me to, to, uh, to take this approach, uh, and that's Erlang. Um, Erlang is another dynamic language. They, they have no types. Uh, but uh, in case you're not familiar with Erlang syntax, which I don't expect you to be, uh, the curlies make vectors in Erlang. The lowercase words are atoms, which are like symbols and uh, uppercase words are variable, variable names. Uh, and this is sort of part of a definition of a server, right, uh, that models a library. So you can check out a book, you can return a book, you can look up who has a book, uh, or you can list what books you have checked out or a person has checked out. And here are the things it might return, right? Uh, it might say, okay, here's your book. It might say that I've already checked out your book, sorry. Uh, it might say that uh, it, it'll, it might give you an okay, here's your books that you've done. And if you pass it something it doesn't understand, it's just gonna give you an error, right? Uh, and here's this translated to Clojure, uh, which is basically the same thing, right? Uh, we just have one definition in the match rather than multiple definitions of destructuring. And, and, and the thing here, uh, to note is that someone else could come along and they could implement library plus, which has uh, all of, which supports all of these commands, uh, plus uh, an another number of them, right? And anyone who can interact with us with this implementation can interact with that implementation as well. Um, but if they start using the other implementations custom, uh, custom commands, then we're gonna give them an error if they try to use it with us. Um, so given that, how do you talk about what is a message to this server, right? It's, it's a variant, for sure, because it's got some tags and some data, um, but the keys aren't fixed. They're, they're extensible, right? And they're extensible with a, with a funny kind of restriction, which is that uh, there, there's kind of a subtyping relationship, right? Like, um, the, the one with fewer options is a subtype of the one with more options. Um, and that can be a little bit hard to deal with, but uh, if you're using these, uh, you should always have a default case. If, if your tag set is extensible, uh, you should always have a default case that uh, handles an error, and you should be able, you should be expecting that to happen. Um, so, and here's the, the rest of the return values, also translated. Um, so to compare, closed variants have known tags. That's sort of what we were working with before. You, you know the tag set, um, and you can, you can be confident that you've covered all the cases. As long as everybody plays by the rules, which you can enforce with a type system, uh, you never have to have a default case, right? Um, if you want the guarantees that everyone is actually playing by the rules, you'll need a type system. Uh, whereas open variants, your tag set is freely extensible but you have to have a default case. Um, and it, they're a little bit harder to type because you need subtyping and then you get into covariance and contravariance and all sorts of complicated stuff. But uh, they're, they're pretty nice to use in a dynamic setting where you don't even think about that. Um, 
So here are a couple standard variants. This is a loop variant. So the, the way this is useful is, say you've got a recursive function, right? And you want to sort of uh, defer the controlling of the recursion to somebody else. Like say, say you want a different part of the code to add traces, like to print something out every time it recurses, or to limit the number of recursions. Um, a priori, if you just use loop recur, you'd, you'd need to edit the code and add in the log statements or pass in some kind of flag that told it what to do. And you'd have to start implementing all those features in your algorithm, which, is, which sort of clutters things. Or instead, if your algorithm, instead of recursing, just does a step and then returns a variant indicating whether it would like to keep recursing or whether it's done, right? Um, and, and you could pretty trivially write a little loop recur thing that destructured this, and as soon as it got stop, uh, just return the thing, and when it gets recur, recurses. Um, and you could write several of them that, that also add counters or add uh, debug statements or um, all sorts of nifty things. Uh, it, it's particularly, uh, particularly useful in language development where you can um, where you, you can limit the, the sort of runtime steps of a, of a thing to get, um, to get some debug control over it. Uh, this is a result variant. Uh, this is extremely commonly used uh, in typed languages especially, especially. Um, but we can use it too. So this is uh, particularly useful if you have error cases that are not exceptions. Um, error cases that are, uh, that are just sort of messages to say, hey, what you tried to do didn't work. Um, so I if your function can fail, it's possible that you want to return one of these. And, and, this, and the fact of returning one of these means that you can't just go ahead and use the val value. You have to check the tag. Right? So, so if you want someone to have to check the error case, oops, uh, return one of these. Um, it's, it's really good for that. So if we want to store this stuff in Datomic, uh, I actually had a different solution to this, and a coworker just a week ago came up with this one uh, that I like a lot. Um, so here's the answer. So if you're not familiar with Datomic, Datomic stores things as uh, more or less vectors of entity, attribute, uh, value, and transaction. And I've elided the transaction here. Um, but this is sort of how you do it. You, each variant value is, is two datums, two, two of these rows. Uh, and they have one attribute saying that this is a variant, and this is the kind of variant that it is. Um, and presumably you can follow that to find out which keys are actually available, or which tags are available. Uh, and then you have an attribute for the tag. And, and this is actually kind of similar to the non-solution we were doing before with the map, um, except that Datomic doesn't actually waste any space when you do this, because it doesn't actually store the, the columns. It literally just stores these vectors. So we're, we're storing it in, in constant space uh, to the number of tags. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, and then in, you can also, because they're each different attributes, you can use the atomics types uh, differently for each one. So the store can be a ref, where the other things can be a string. And you don't have to do any uh, backflips to, to do polymorphism in atomic, which you can do uh, with uh, fancy refs, but uh, but this is much more direct, and you don't have to look up another uh, another level. So this is what the schema looks like. If you've never seen a datomic schema before, this might be a little overwhelming. Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, this all we're doing here is we're we're defining. We're saying, hey, there's a a thing in our database called uh, GB order, uh, and we've we've namespaced our tags by the way, as is the convention in datomic. Um, so we, we've got this. Uh, variant called GB order. It's a thing that exists. That's what we're declaring. Uh, and here we're declaring that there's an attribute called GB order delivery, which is one of our tags. Um, and with the underscore, as you saw in the talk before, the underscore adds a, a, a reverse, um, a reverse relation. So this says, uh, add me as an install attribute on DB part DB. So we're declaring that we're an attribute. And then here we're saying, oops, here we're saying add me as one of the variants of GB order. Right? And you, you would repeat this three times, one for each thing. It's a little bit verbose, but uh, it has all the information that you want. 
You can set a value type. Oops. You can set a value type. It's uh, and they're independent. Um, it would be really nice if uh, if you could enforce that exactly one of these things was defined. And you can do this with transactor functions. Uh, it just hasn't been done as far as I know. Um, it would be really nice if that was just sort of there and easy to use um, or packaged in some way. Um, it'd be really nice if you could just say this thing is a variant and here's what kind of variant it is um, and, and have that as a first class element of the schema. Um, so takeaways. Uh, the first is learn to see variants everywhere. Um, I've seen so much code that has variants that are begging to get out. Um, so so le look for them. Uh, eagerly search for them. Uh, especially if you have something where, it, if you have an OO background, you might reach for a shallow subclass hierarchy with an abstract class at the top, right? Um, this is a really nice uh, time to use variants. Um, Friends don't let friends use a map when a variant will do. Uh, teach each other this, help stop the uh, unnecessary NPEs. Uh, it's, it's pretty sad, when, especially when, uh, and, and complain about it, right? Like there's so many serialization formats that just don't support this. I'm looking at JSON and I'm looking at YAML. I'm calling those two out <laughs> because there's really no good way to do it. I mean, you could do arrays with strings in them, but it's pretty cumbersome. Um, Eden, however, is fantastic at this. Uh, and do it. And, and trust that when people see this, they will understand what pattern you're using. And if they don't, and if they complain at you, you can send them my way, and I will take care of them. Um, this, is, this is a real pattern. Uh, and it, it comes from a very long history of, uh, of typed functional languages. Um, and we can start using it here. So go back to your job or your hobbies or whatever and, and put this in your code. Uh, it, it will help you. So that's all I got. Do I have any questions? Uh, here in the front. The question was, uh, how, how complex can this destructuring be with the match macro? Um, and it can be, I think it can be arbitrarily nested. Um, the, the core match docs will, will help you out there. It's, uh, it's pretty powerful. Yeah, yeah, it really, so the, the question was uh, about the extensibility of variants and about whether, whether you can actually extend the variant list without modifying their code. And that's absolutely correct. And that, that's sort of the, the limitation of, of open variants and, and why closed variants tend to be a little bit more uh, reliable. But if, you've, if, in, if in their code they've always handled the default case, uh, then, then you can trust that the default case will be used there even if it's an error condition. Um, so if you're using open variants, you have to kind of be prepared for that. Uh, it, here. Uh, so the question was converting back to either JSON or YAML. Uh, and whether, uh, and the suggestion was that maybe we could just revert to using type tags. Um, that, so that's all right. Uh, I, I, I would prefer to just use uh, arrays and strings myself, uh, but that's really up to you. I mean, these, these serialization formats are unfortunately just not helping us out at all here. So, um, so you can either have like a, 
a tag and a content key on an object, uh, which I've seen done. It's, it's not that great to use, but it gets the job done. You can send it over the wire. Um, but you can also just use arrays and strings. There was another, oh, yeah? Oh, how multi-methods fit into this picture. So multi-methods are actually uh, pretty great, and they, uh, they go most of the way. So if, if, you're, if you have a function that takes a variant, a single variant as an argument, or maybe even two variants, uh, it's, it's possible that you could have used multi-methods to solve the problem as well, uh, which allows people to extend it and, and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, so, so they have some advantages. The, the problem with multi-methods is that they only cover the case of variants as arguments to functions. Uh, and, and they don't cover uh, returning them from functions or using them in other kinds of values or like having a value that is, that is the or of it. So that you can destructure when someone passes you something that has a symbol in it, but, but that's all you can do. There, there was another question here. Someone put their hand down. Yeah? Yeah, that's uh, closure core match. Um, I, I think it's in contrib. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, if you search closure core match, you'll find it. All right. Oh. Uh, one more uh, sitting down. <clears throat> so you're talking about val validating whether the, uh, the actual data in the variant is, is sort of correct? Um, well, there's two ways to do that. I mean, the, the, most, the, the most solid one is obviously types. Um, I, I will stop harping on that now. Uh, but you can also just do a check in, in the destructuring, and that, that adds a little bit of code. Um, but you'd have to do that anyway uh, if you wanted to do that. You can also uh, validate beforehand with a Herbert uh, schema if you've just got data. I mean, if you've put lambdas or host objects in these things, you, there's a limit to what you can do with uh, Eden, but uh, as long as it's just plain data, you're, you're golden. Okay, thank you very, very much.